Well, what a what a pleasure for me it is to be with you again here. It's um, you know as we as we go to God's word, you know, I, for me, I it goes to me. <laughs> if you could say it that way through the week and um, and dealing with the things that that I've been studying. You know, last week we talked about basically um, Paul's addressing the false teachers, and he's and I titled basically the next three lessons the the common dangers facing the church. And last week we were dealing with legalism, and it's just interesting how the Lord works in my own heart first before I ever put pen to paper. And as I'm writing, the Lord brings things to my mind, and and um, the Lord the Lord really also did that this week as well, and, and He does it every week, but. Especially when we're talking about today, we're going to be dealing with the danger of mysticism. And now, just the word itself, you're thinking, well, you know, we're not mystics. But as we, as we get into the text, we realize what a danger it really is for the current church. And danger even for us uh, as a solid biblical church. Because what Paul has been doing in Colossians is he's been warning these believers. He's, he's been setting up where he's going now. From this point on, he's, he's getting intensely applicational with these guys. All right, So he's, he's already set up and he said that Christ is supreme. Christ is supreme over the, all the creation, right? Colossians chapter 1. He's supreme over all of the new creation, including our lives, including the church, including the, the future new heavens and the new earth when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And then he moved on to chapter 2 and he said that Christ is sufficient, right? You don't have to worry, you don't have to, to listen, you don't have to be, be beguiled and enslaved and held captive to worldly philosophy, which is a philosophy as a system, right, based on the elementary principles of this world that, that is opposed to God. Any of those worldly systems that, that try to define the nature of man, our condition, our salvation, our destiny, and where we came from, right? So he says Christ is sufficient, and he does that, and he says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, that Jesus Christ is the God-man. He's, he's so fullness of deity dwells in Him in bodily form. He's fully God and fully man. So he makes that point saying that Jesus is sufficient because He's God, right? And He's man, right? We can relate to us in our weaknesses as a high priest because He experienced suffering. He experienced the things that we experience. And then He's fully God. He has the power over all things. And then he makes another statement in the very next verse, in verse 10 of chapter 2, where he says that in Him you dwell, you're complete. So not only is He God fully, but in Him you are complete. And you're complete because you're in union with Him, right? So He's utterly sufficient. So that brings us where we are today. Now this section is one section. It's verse 16 of chapter 2 all the way through verse 23. Okay, so I want to read verse 16. I'll start at verse 16 and we'll stop at verse 19, but we're going to be dealing with specifically verse 18 and 19 today. So verse 16 of Colossians, Colossians, excuse me. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regards to food or drink, in respect to festival or new moon or Sabbath, which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in the self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. So in the religious climate that we live in today, there is an intolerance. Right? There's an intolerance. And I would say there's even an intolerance in a lot of churches. It's an intolerance for sound biblical doctrine. Right? You hear the phrase often in many churches, doctrine divides and love edifies. Right? And in some ways, that, that statement is true because doctrine does divide. It divides truth from error. Right? And the basic sense of doctrine is your set of beliefs. We say, well, you know, I, I want to lift up love, but you have to have something to base your beliefs are. You believe something. You have some set of beliefs. 
They can either be biblical beliefs or non-biblical beliefs. Right? You can have some doctrinal beliefs. They can be accurate or they can be error. And so we live in a, in a culture that values experience, it values feelings and emotions, and they place these above the truth of Scripture. Right? Too many Christians are looking for self-help guides, and they're looking for superficial fellowship rather than a biblically-based teaching that teaches them, that helps them to, to obey God, love His people, and hate their sin. Right? We, too many believers in the church, they seek after experiences. And you see this in a, in a huge way in the charismatic movement. Right? We're seeking, they're seeking some higher knowledge or some higher experience that's set apart from Scripture. And they often they validate their teaching and they, they reference their teaching. They validate it through some unverifiable experience, like a vision or a dream. And they pressure others to accept this vision or accept this dream. And they say, look, if you won't follow me, you're either not a Christian or you are less spiritual or mature if you won't hold to this emotional experience. You see, Christians will often fall prey to this if they're not grounded in the Word of God. I get tired of hearing how these, these leaders promote this subjective emotional experiences. They do this to control congregations. Now, doctrine in itself, it does divide. Like I said before, it divides truth from error. And we don't have to look for experiences and, and have an emotionally driven worship service to glorify God and worship the Lord. Right? It's not about our emotions per se. It's how our emotions are filtered through our thoughts and our intellect as we, as we meditate and we respond to the truths of the Word of God. Right? As we get together and worship, there is an emotional component. But that emotion comes as we dwell on who Jesus is, what He's done for us. Right? And as we, as, we, as we are bound up in that joy, the Holy Spirit brings thoughts to our mind and, and we, we just glorify God with a great joy. We don't pursue the emotional experience, we pursue Christ. Right? And if the emotional experience isn't there, it doesn't mean you haven't worshipped. Right? We, we, we subjugate our emotions to the truth. And we often miss, we can miss what's right in front of us if we pursue emotional experiences. Now, do you guys probably know of the Parks Observatory? It's one of those famous Australian landmarks. It's often in movies. It's those big, huge, like, satellite receiving dishes. You know, that's what they are. They're the radio signals. Well, I was reading an article, and for 17 years, the Parks Radio Observatory, they kept receiving these, these signals, these radio signals, and they could not figure out where they were coming from. So you have this multi-billion dollar antenna designed to receive radio signals, and they were receiving these radio signals, and they couldn't figure out where they were coming from. They finally narrowed it down and said, well, we believe they're coming from within five kilometers of this particular uh, antenna. And they kept thinking, well, maybe it's lightning strikes. And they do the research and say, well, there were no, no satellite recorded lightning strikes. And they couldn't figure it out. And they said, well, 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 what is these things? What are these things? Well, they finally in, uh, in, installed a new piece of technology last, uh, last January. And basically, it, it measured interference. And they found that these signals, they, they were coming out basically at 2.4 gigahertz, which is the same signal, same frequency as a microwave. And it turns out that the signals that they were receiving were, in fact, the microwave from the office where the maintenance crew would go in and they would warm up their meals. So here's this billion-dollar radio tower searching for radio signals in outer space. They couldn't figure out that they were receiving radio signals from a their own microwave in the office in the, uh, in the building where the maintenance guys would go in to heat their dinner. You know, the answer was literally right in front of it, right? Well, that's how it is for so many churches. They, they search for you know, great emotional worship, or they, they search for, for visions and dreams, or they, they want to have these tremendous experiences when in reality what they have is already right in front of them, and it's the Word of God. 
So Paul's warning these believers. As we dig in today, you'll see he's, he's warning these Colossians that these false teachers in their midst are seeking to lead them astray. And they're seeking to do it by appealing to mystical experiences. They're, speaking, they're trying to, to lead them away from Jesus Christ and His sufficiency. Right? Because if you have Jesus Christ and Him alone, and as we'll talk about in a few minutes, you have His Word, do you really need anything else? You don't, and that's Paul's point here. So let's go and look down at the text. So these, these false teachers, they were first of all saying, in verse 18, Paul says, Look, No one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels. So first of all, the, the false teachers were defrauding these believers. The word here is beguiling. They were condemning. The, the idea here is, is to be an umpire, right? You've watched a sporting event, you have an umpire, and the umpire decides against someone in order to rob them of their prize. An umpire decides, all right, I don't like that play. I'm talking about a uh, bad call. I'm talking about their willful deciding that, you know what, I'm going to disqualify that person because they aren't playing by my rules. And that's what these false teachers were doing. They were going in, they were beguiling, they were, they were judging them, they were trying to defraud them of their prize that is, what, their relationship and their, the joy, the fullness of life in Jesus Christ, right? They were spiritual referees, right? And they were saying that, look, if you don't play by my rules, you're either A, not a Christian, or B, you're not spiritually mature, or you're not going to mature as a Christian. Right? And it's interesting because Paul says, like, let no one, not even one single person, he's demanding that they stop allowing even one person to defraud them of their prize in Christ. And these, these defrauders, these false teachers, were using deception, charm, persuasion to deceive, to influence, and they were garnering a following. And the following was enough that, what, Epaphras goes to Paul. Right? He says, look, we, he's already talked about you've got a group that's very judgmental and legalistic, and you also have these false teachers that are, that are taking their stand, as we'll see in a moment, on visions and dreams and the worship of angels, and they're, they're condemning others who don't believe them and don't follow them, and they're, getting, and they're, they're gaining a following. They're gaining a foothold into the church. And the reason I call this section, or I call this the danger of mysticism, because mysticism in itself is the pursuit of a deeper or higher subjective religious experience. Okay, So you're pursuing a deeper or higher subjective religious experience. So we have the Word of God as the objective truth, right? It doesn't change, right? We have different translations, right? But the Word of God doesn't change in the original language, right? Okay? So subjective is that it's individual determinant, right? My subjective truth, right, I hold to a certain set of beliefs, could be different than your subjective truth. Now, I'm, I'm talking about unbelievers, if we were unbelievers, right? You have people, or people say this all the time, well, you know, uh, that doesn't, I don't, I don't believe that. Or what this passage means to me, I hear state people say those things, right? That's subjective, Right? I, take, I take the Word of God or I take whatever happens and I, I relate it and I subjugate it to my own personal belief system. Okay? So mysticism seeks this higher or, or emotional subjective experience. Okay? So spiritual reality that, that we live is based on emotions and feelings. It often comes out in anti-doctrine or anti-intellectualism. Right? You'll say, you know, I've had discussions with charismatic guys before, and, and they'll say, well, I'll say, well, you know, do you study the Word of God? Well, you know, that, that kind of stuff, we, we don't want to divide people. We want to be unified. I'm like, well, doctrine divides, but it also unifies. If you don't have a system of beliefs, then what do you believe in? Right? Well, you know, we just trust the Lord. He's going to reveal Himself. Well, He reveals Himself in His Word, right? This is kind of the circular argument. In this past July, American swimmer Lily King was disqualified moments after winning the 200-meter breaststroke at the World Championships in South Korea. She's been a vocal critic of FINA, which is the organization that administers these swimming sports. But she's been a, a vocal critic about how uh, it's, it's silly we've allowed these Chinese swimmers to come in, and they've, they've been proven, it's been proven that they're doping, 
They're using performance-enhancing drugs, and she was a, a vocal critic. Well, she just won the 200-meter breaststroke, and they disqualified her, and they said that, that she, didn't, she didn't touch the wall with both hands. All right. So the Americans, they said they appealed it. Well, they lost the appeal, and they're, they're asking, asking Athena to release the video, which they won't. And what's interesting about this is, is are, they, are they punishing her? for her fact that she's called them out on their, on their stand, or, her, or their stand for allowing these Chinese swimmers. Now, I use this as an example because we don't know if it's true or not. I want to clarify that. I don't know if they've disqualified her for, for personal you know, reasons. But the implication is there, right? But that's these false teachers. They, they disqualify you because you don't follow their sets of rules, their own standard. You don't follow them when they put forth a vision or a dream or they put forth some subjective experience, if you don't follow that, then you're less of a Christian. You're less mature than they are. So my, my challenge for you is don't allow people to set themselves as referees over your behavior when it comes to the spiritual realm and cause you that personal anguish, right? Don't, don't listen to people who put forth a theology, if you even will, of subjective experience. Right? Don't listen to people who say you, you have to have this emotional experience or you are not truly a Christian or you are not truly mature if you don't go into church every Sunday and be, are slain in the Spirit, right? to use their terminology. Right? If you don't go into church and, and you don't speak in so-called tongues, right? it means you're less of a Christian in their eyes. Don't allow... Your maturity to be questioned. We hold to an objective truth. We take every experience that we have, and we, what do we do? We take it, and no matter how powerful a dream, I've had great dreams, right? I've had great dreams where the Lord's in those dreams. Right? Does that mean that just because I have a dream, it's from God? Eh, my mind's thinking of things that I've learned, right? You know, I always take that dream and what? Or that experience or a vision or whatever it is. And you, you say, all right, well, how does it match up with the Word of God? The Word of God is our standard, right? It's objective. It doesn't change. So Paul says, look, let no one act as your judge in verse 16. And then he says, let no one defraud you. Right? They defraud you of your prize, of, of your goal, whether you know, in, in all of these settings, when Paul's writing these letters, there are unbelievers there. Right? And so he's one one says he's challenging them and saying, Look, you know, if you're in church and you're learning about the Lord, don't allow these false teachers to lead you down a path that pollutes and perverts the gospel so that you lose your prize of salvation. Right? Because you're never a believer. Or if you're a believer and you're you're hearing this, don't allow them to take away your the fullness that you have of the spiritual life in Christ. What, what a kill joy, if you want to use that term. You know, you're, you're experiencing joy in Christ and you're thankful for what, what you have. And somebody comes along and says, well, you know what? I, I've had this vision and, 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 you know, God's told me this and this and this. And if you don't follow my vision, if you don't follow what the Lord has revealed to me, then you must not be a true Christian, right? You see how, see how intimidating that is? They use intimidation and deception, Right? And they could very well be deceived themselves. Right? It, it very well could be intentional as they're just trying to gain, gain a following right? for financial gain, as Peter says in Second Peter. Or it could very well be they are deceived themselves. So don't allow people to do that to you. And then he says, look, how do they do it? Right? And then he goes on and he gives, he says, he's, look, he gives basically four things. And he says, they, they do it full of false humility. And angel worship. Okay, so the word here, false humility, is self-abasement, right? It's, it's pride in the humility. What, so what they would say is they would basically say, look, you know, I'm not really good. You know, God is so good and He's, he's so, so powerful and he, you know, he's, he's so far removed from us that I'm just, I'm just not good enough for God, right? And you know what? I, I had this... This vision and basically, you know, we need to have some kind of mediator between God and man because God is so transcendent. He's so far above us that us as measly humans, we can't know God, right? So they're putting forth and they're putting forth mediators. They're putting forth uh, actually the worship of angels as we're talking about. Just a second, they're putting forth these as 
as mediators between God and man. And they would do it in the sense of false humility. Well, you know, I'm not that good, and I know I'm, I'm terrible, but you know, well, well, we, need to, we need to worship the Lord, and we need to do it in a way that uh, we can approach God, and I have a solution, and that solution is, well, you know, a special revelation or a special word of knowledge that God's given me, and that word of knowledge tells us that we need to, we need to worship angels, or we need, to, we need to really venerate angels, right? Because for, for these believers, now, it, it's natural to think of God as transcendent, right? He, he is other than us, right? He's, he's holy, right? He's the creator of all things. And the Jewish, and the, this was great Jewish influence on them because the, the Jewish thought at that time believed that God was unapproachable. See, they had taken all those rules and regulations regarding the tabernacle and the temple and how there's a holy of holies and said, well, we can't approach God. It's impossible, right? We have to have the priests, right? They, they misunderstood that what God was trying to teach them was that God was holy and they're not, Right? God actually says in Jeremiah, if you, you seek me with all your heart, that's where you'll find me. God wanted them to approach him, to come to them in faith, and that was the whole point. He was teaching them they were sinners, not that he was utterly unapproachable. The doctrines of transcendence versus eminence, right? You want to look that up, read about it sometime. Now, there's always that balance. God is above us, and he is, he is way above on his throne. But he also is eminent in the sense that we can know him. Right? He indwells us, after all. Right? Through Jesus Christ, we've been reconciled. So they were taking this, this Jewish influence and they were saying that God is so far removed that we have to have some something else. Right? That Jesus wasn't enough. That's basically what they were saying. There wasn't, it wasn't sufficient for them. And they were putting forth this false humility. It's like what Jesus tells the Pharisees on the Sermon on the Mount, right? Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. You, you do things so people can see you. They have this air of, well, I'm just so humble, right? I was thinking about my sermon this week and thinking about how great it really was and great it was going to be, and, but I'm just, just too, too humble to mention it to you, you know, right? So they have this false humility. And, so they're, and it's interesting because he says they delight in it, right? They delight in this false humility. They delight in this worship of angels. Look, they, God is so far above me. I know I need some help to understand him. And you know what? You're too proud to admit you need help. But you know what? Jesus is great, but we need some more help. And you're just too proud. You're not as humble as I am to admit that Jesus Christ isn't enough and that you need some help. That's how they would put this forth, Right? See, they would cloak their, their, their judgmental behavior behind a religious terminology and, and they become offended when you, when you say, well, that doesn't make sense or that isn't right or that isn't scriptural. Believers, it's not about how sincere they are. The question is, are they correct? Right? Someone comes into our midst and says, well, I had a great dream or I had a vision or, or I really believe that Jesus Christ isn't enough, that we need more, we need to, we need to have kind of some, some angels between us, or we need Mary as our mediator, right? It doesn't matter how sincere they are. And as Christians, we naturally want to be loving towards people, but it doesn't matter about how sincere they are, it matters whether or not they're correct, okay? Because a false teacher may be very sincere, they may be deceived themselves, right? And so what they were saying, not only were they had this false sense of humility, but they were combining that with angel worship. And you're thinking in your mind, like, really? Angel worship? Now, the Jews struggled with angel worship, right? A lot of people don't realize, see, the Jews knew, and Scripture says that in Hebrews and Galatians and Acts, uh, Galatians especially 3.19 says the law was ordained through angels, right? When, when Moses is up on Mount Sinai... Galatians, Paul says Galatians, and it says in Acts, Stephen says the same thing. The laws came through Moses or came through angels. So God, through angels, gave Moses the law, right? Hebrews says the same thing, the word spoken by angels to Moses. So the Jews venerated, they, they believed angels were powerful beings, and they are, right? The Jews struggled with venerating angels. You know what? With angels, angels are creating beings, they're the great, powerful beings. 
right? We don't know a lot about them other than what's revealed in Scripture, right? They're not these like puffy cloud kind of people, Cupid, little wings. They're powerful beings. In fact, you know, Satan is said to be, right, described himself as an angel of light, described as a beautiful, created, most beautiful of all the angels, right? He's not some little demonic guy with pitchforks. He's a beautiful angel. Now, he's fallen. He's evil. And it's interesting when you look at when you look at this area of Asia Minor, they struggle with angel worship, right? They worship them almost as, as gods themselves. In fact, the archangel Michael was worshipped as late as 739 A.D. in Colossae. They built a temple to the archangel Michael, right? The whole region was plagued for centuries. In fact, they had a council in Laodicea in AD 363, in which they told some of the, some of the, the prominent pastors, and when they got together a council, they basically had to write a ruling saying, don't worship angels. They looked at these angels, and this is kind of an early Gnosticism, looked at these angels as mediators. Like you had to have something between God and man. You needed it. Right? So there's, there's a false humility, there's a false angel worship. Like many religions place an emphasis on angels. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is the archangel Michael. Right? Mormons believe that Jesus is brother the Lucifer. Catholic Church has festivals that celebrate the archangels, as does the Greek Orthodox Church. Right? There's many, many religious groups that venerate angels. And I'm saying that you shouldn't show them respect. But I always love John. John's in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 19, Revelation 20, and, and uh, he's seeing all these wonderful, beautiful, amazing things, right? And this angel shows him, shows him something wonderful, uh, Revelation 19. And John drops down on his, on his knees and starts trying to worship. And the angel's like, stop it, stop it, get up, get up, get up, what are you doing? He basically says, look, don't, he says, I'm, your, I'm a fellow servant of the Almighty, I worship God. You imagine the angels looking at him going, get up, get up, get up, get up, what are you doing? Right? Angels, angels, angels always, they always refuse worship. Okay? So, so Paul says, look, they, they delight in self-abasement and the worship of angels. But not only that, they take their source of authority from visions they have seen, inflated without cause by their fleshly mind in verse 18. So the first thing that Paul says is they... they, they they have a false humility and they worship angels and they, they take their stand. They, they have a source of authority. is based off the visions. They take your stand is to take one stand on the basis of, of what you believe. And on visions you've seen, they, they, they basically became sold out to their claimed experiences. Now, whether they were real experiences or they were just made up for a following, we don't know, Right? So the, the, the visions are when they say that what they've seen, you're, you're trying to end to an ecstatic or emotional state through their angel worship, right? They love, these are the people that they love to talk about their visions or their visionary experiences. They come into a, a church and they say, well, I had a vision and it was amazing. And, and Jesus spoke to me and said, well, you know, we have to do this. Or we have to do that. They're never satisfied. Right? They've had this vision. They're always looking for, for more religious experiences. And then they judge you to whether or not you've had this experience. You know, I had a friend that I worked with. I was working in the furniture business, and he was going to a charismatic church, and he would come, and I'd see him. And, you know, I'd, every once in a while, we'd get together on Monday, which I love getting together on Monday with him because so he'd talk about his church service. And, and he got to a point where he was so discouraged. And I, I remember going, like, why are you so discouraged? Like, what's going on? I mean, church was yesterday. And he was, oh, man. He said, every time I go to church, he said, you know what? He said, I haven't spoken in tongues yet. I'm like, okay. Well, what do you mean you haven't spoken in tongues? And, uh, and he said, well, you know, if I haven't spoken in tongues, then I haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so I'm not a believer. Right? That's charismatic theology. Right? If you didn't have this, this powerful emotional experience, you're not a Christian. Now, I did my best to walk him through Scripture and say, look, baptism is the Holy Spirit. It's, it's an event that happens when you get saved. There's, it's, not a, it's not an Acts 2 type event. That was a one-time affair. We're, all, we're baptized in the Holy Spirit when we join the body of Christ. Right? It's an eternal event. 
right? And I walked them through speaking what <laughs> so-called tongues is from their perspective and biblical perspective, speaking in known, uh, unknown languages as a gift to reach those that, that don't know your language and how it's not used, not in effect today. I had to learn Greek. I wish I had the gift of tongues. I automatically know it like that, right? Come to any language. I'm having to learn Australian. I'm just kidding. So, you know, you, what would discourage, how discouraged he was. They had robbed him of his, of his joy. They robbed him of his assurance and his security in Christ. He was a, he was a believer. I kept, finally, I, I kept challenging him enough, and I was like, you've got to go to another church. You've got to go somewhere where they aren't teaching this false doctrine, this false set of beliefs that's all about experience. He finally did. And I remember him coming to me going, oh, brother, you know, like, I had a great worship experience. I didn't feel everybody pressure me. Everybody kept asking me, have you spoken in tongues yet? Have you spoken in tongues yet? Because in their minds, if you hadn't spoken in tongues, he's not a believer. How have you spoken in tongues? He's like, it was like every service is the first thing they'd ask me, not, how are you doing? How was your week? You know, your mom's sick? You know, have you spoken in tongues yet? For me, you're old enough to remember, I'm not, Oral Roberts. Right? Oral Roberts in the United States, he was a televangelist. He kind of popularized the whole televangelist and prosperity movement that we have today. Back in the 70s, that's why I said I don't remember. In the 70s, he, he basically sent out a letter to you know, many people around him and many people that he was his quote-unquote followers. And he basically said a, um, a 900-foot Jesus appeared to him. And he said, a 900-foot Jesus appeared to him and told him that, this is in a fundraising letter. I've, I've read the letter. And it said that um, if, you don't, if, if I don't receive a certain amount of donations, um, that basically, well, sorry, the 900-foot Jesus appeared to him and said that, hey, I want you to build this medical center. And then if you don't receive a certain amount of donations by the end of the year, I'm going to kill you. And so he's writing letters, and he's like crying. He's like, Jesus is going to kill me if I don't get, you know, $3.4 million by the end of the year. And, and, and uh, I mean, talking about a fundraising tactic. Imagine I said, we got to have new money for the church, and God's going to kill me if you guys don't donate, right? That'll work. And he's crying. I mean, now whether he saw the Jesus or whether he didn't, it, it doesn't matter. Because what Jesus was saying is clearly not in line up with Scripture, Right? You know, and so you have these guys, and now he was ridiculed for that. And, and that, but how many of these guys you see on TV, or these, these gals on TV, and they, they make absurd claims, right? And then, by the, way, by the way, Oral Roberts kind of founded that whole seed faith ministry. Oh, if you sow a seed, you get it back. Sorry, they always speak like that. You know, they, oh, Lord, he said. And they, you know, they're wiping their brow because they're sweating. I'm thinking about Rod Parsley. But, you know, they, they, that seed faith movement, like you, you, you sow a seed, you reap a lot, right? One thing about false teachers, and Peter says this in Second Peter, is for most, if not all, it's all about the money, right? It's all about the money. They're after, they're, they're trying to squeeze the sheep, not for not for love. They're trying to shear the sheep for money. So Paul says, look, they're, they're, they're basing their authority on the source, their visions they have seen, right? Dreams, ecstatic experiences. And these Gentiles were used to these, these mystical experiences. Right near Colossae in Heropolis, right down the road, you have, you have Laodicea, you have Heropolis, all in this area, in the same Lycus Valley, there was what's was called the, the Plutonium or Plato's Gates. And basically, they, they've actually found this. For a long time, they thought it didn't exist, but they found it. And what you would do, you wanted to know something. It was kind of like the oracle at Delphi. It was a, the plutonium was called the, the Pluto's oracle. Pluto, by the way, is the gate to hell, right? And what would happen is there was a little room, and there was a cave in the back of that room. And these, the priest would go in there. And they would come out and they would tell you what the oracle says. You'd ask them a question. You'd ask them, um, you know, what about this? You know, what lottery numbers I should play? Just kidding, you know. You'd ask them different questions and they would, they would go and answer. But what was interesting about this little plutonium is that, and they, the reason they, they, they know about it now, they found it, is the, there was an underground chamber, a little cave, and there was a river and it would release a lot of carbon dioxide. So it was very poisonous. And so what they do, these, these priests would sell birds or little animals, and they'd say, hey, throw this in the room, and the birds would die. And so the priests, they had learned, like these diving, the, the guys you see in the, um, the Polynesian swimmers, you know, they can dive underwater. 
and stay underwater for like, you know, five minutes and hunt fish. I don't know if you've ever watched a documentary on one of those guys. It's amazing. They, they train their lungs. These priests would do that. They would train themselves to hold their breath for extended periods of time. And they also knew they'd go in these caves, and because carbon dioxide is a, a heavier gas, they knew there were pockets in the cave where they could come up for air. And so the priest would go in there, and naturally, if they came out alive, oh, it's a miracle. They survived the, the, the gate to hell, the plutonium's gate, and they would come out with these, these oh, I saw a vision, or I, I can answer your question. And, they, and this, they, they got money. They got money for doing that. And they found this. This was right down the road from Colossae. So the Gentiles were used to people coming in and saying, well, well I had a visionary experience, or I had a mystical experience. You need to follow me. You need to listen to me. This is the culture they were coming out of. Look, just because a person claims to have a vision from God and they take their stand on it and they're, they're firm on it, you have to choose, all right, where's the objective truth? The objective truth is the Word of God. right? He's already told them that Christ is sufficient. Don't listen to Him. And then he says, look, not only are they the source of authority of visions, is they're, they're proud without cause. Look down also in verse 18. He says, they're inflated without cause. They, they, they're like a balloon. They're puffed up, right? They're promoting their visions and their experiences, and they're, they're special, and everyone else should think they're special, right? There's, and Paul says there's no real reason. It's like rebel without a cause, only it's proud without a cause. Have you ever heard of proud flesh? You ever heard of proud flesh, right? If you had horses, most people, it's, it's more, become more of a veterinary term now, but my, my sister had horses. In fact, I was texting her last night. I said, do you remember we, you know, proud flesh? She goes, oh, yeah, and she was giving me examples and stuff. What happens is, is a horse like, will cut its leg, and as the wound heals, what happens if the wound doesn't heal properly, what is it, it, it becomes all red, and basically the flesh will kind of swell up around it. Right, And it will stay kind of a, a running wound. It won't heal properly. And what they have to do is they either have to burn it or cauterize it, or they have to kind of cut it and allow the skin to heal properly. Right? The idea is it's, it's puffed up above all other flesh. That it's drawing attention to itself, hence the name proud flesh. Right? Well, these believers, they were, these, sorry, these false teachers were proud without cause. And he says not only is it without cause, but it, he said it comes from their fleshly mind. Knowledge on its own makes arrogant. And if you say you have special knowledge, you can only imagine how arrogant they were. If you don't have my special knowledge, if you don't follow my special vision, if you don't follow my leading, my, my, my experiential um, feelings that I've had, then you're less of a Christian, right? Because their subjective visions or experiences, they can't be proven. The proud fleshly mind always seeks after self promotion, self-glorification, because our mind and our reason are dominated by our sinful nature. That's one thing, when you think about unbelievers, you say, well, if only we could convince them, you know, of the claims of Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit working in their heart, they won't accept it, because the mind is affected by the flesh. And that's what Paul is saying here, that their, their authority, their visions, their, their pride is all based off of their, what? Their flesh, their sinful nature. They thought, think of, think of the arrogance, think of that you can supply in people's life what is lacking in the gospel. Right? I can supply what you need in your life even more so than Christ can. Right? Now they may quite say it like that, but that's that's the effect. So they were proud without cause. Pr- proud without cause. Now, one thing about visions, real quick, just to kind of give you guys just general thoughts about visions. So, if somebody comes to you in a vision, one thing you need to realize is that you always should have, you always should place emphasis and primacy of, for objective truth over subjective experience, right? You have a dream, somebody has a vision, somebody, somebody, somebody told you about a vision, you always go back and say, all right, well, let's take it to the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 1 says, in the, in, the, in the days past, God spoke in many portions, in many ways, to the fathers and the prophets, right, through visions and dreams. But he says, now in the New Testament, He has spoken through His Son, Jesus Christ. John 17, 17 says, 
He says, sanctify them, this is Jesus' prayer, sanctify them in truth, my word is truth. If Jesus is truth and God's word is truth, and God's word, what? Tells us about the revelation of God, tells us about Jesus Christ. That's the mystery Paul has been saying over and over in Colossians, and he says it in Ephesians. The mystery is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the predetermined plan, sacrificed himself so that he reconcile what? A group of people together into one body, the church, Jews and Gentiles. That's the mystery. Right? It's God's revelation to us. Christ is revealed to us in His Word. And then I love what, pers- what Peter says in 2 Peter, and we talked about this in our Bible study a couple weeks ago, is that Peter says in, in 2 Peter, he says, look, I saw the risen Lord. Right? We, we experienced the, the great uh, transfiguration. And he says, verse 16 of chapter 2, I'm oh, sorry, verse 16, chapter 1 of 2 Peter. We did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. He said, we didn't make it up. It isn't a myth or story. We saw Jesus transfigured, right? We saw His glory. And He said, and then when He received honor and glory from God the Father... By the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. So he saw Jesus transfigured in a preview of his glory. He heard God the Father, right? And this is the kicker. Verse 19, but he says, we have the prophetic word more sure. You can be more confident in the word of God than you can even in the Apostle Peter's vision, right? Even in Apostle Peter's experience, Because Peter knew one simple fact, verse 14, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. He knew he was going to die, and all the firsthand accounts of Jesus' life were going to die with them. Right? All the apostles died. There's no one left that had seen firsthand Jesus. So God, in His mercy to us, in His grace, gave us the Word of God. So that the Word of God is more sure than any experience that you could possibly have. Because the Word of God is objective truth. And he says that in verse 20, But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by the act of human will, but men were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God. Right? Timothy says that Scripture is God-breathed. So when you think about visions and experiences, we always go back to objective truth. Jesus told the Pharisees in Matthew 12, they they said, look, show us a sign and we'll believe. And he said, I'm not going to give you a sign, you adulterous generation. How do you like that for secret sensitive? You adulterous generation, I'm not giving you a sign. I'm giving you the only sign I'll give you is a sign of Jonah. They said that he was going to die and rise from the dead in three days. And even then they still didn't believe, right? They They paid the Roman soldiers to cover it up. He gave them the sign that he asked for. And then they covered it up. But Jesus says, look, don't, don't seek for signs. If you're seeking for signs and experience and visions and dreams, then you are saying that Jesus' words are not enough. And that's what I say is the danger for so many churches is they, they, they look for visions and dreams and they want to have these great experiences. But in reality, they need to go to the Word of God because they're saying that Jesus' words aren't enough for their lives, that Jesus' words, God's Word, is not sufficient. And brothers and sisters, this is, this is borne out in little ways. Like I'll give you just one small example. There's nothing wrong with reading books. I love reading books, especially books, you know, theology books and things. I used to teach us in seminary that you can go through seminary and, and have no relationship with the Lord because you're reading all these theology books and you're not spending time in the, in the Word of God. Right? We can read all these self-help books, you know, how to be a better Christian mom, be a Christian dad, and there's nothing wrong with those things. But the question is, do you spend as much time in the Word of God as you do in the books, Right? Because you're saying it by your actions, if not literally out loud, that the Word of God isn't completely sufficient, right? And a lot of these books are great because they help explain the Word of God, but it's not a substitute, right? So you have objective truth over subjective experience. Also, you need to know that Satan is a counterfeiter, right? Coloss- oh, sorry, 2 Corinthians 11 says that he disguises himself as an angel of light. He presents himself as pleasing, as beautiful, as enlightening, as powerful, as life-changing, right? His minions and their teaching appear this way. There's, we know there's false prophets. 
We know there's false teachers, and we know there's false apostles. And in Revelation, we have a false trinity. Right? Satan counterfeits God in his work. Right? If, he can, if he can give somebody a vision and it, and it pollutes the idea of who Jesus is, then he succeeded. Right? He succeeded in diluting the gospel and polluting the gospel. And what? Blinding the minds of unbelievers, which he does in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. We're told by John in 1 John 4, 1, to, to test the spirits. In other words, just because somebody has a so-called dream or a vision and they say it's about Jesus doesn't mean its origin is Jesus. Look, our response is theology from Scripture comes before any experience that we have or that somebody comes to us and say they have. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God in Romans 10, 17. Right? That's the normal process by which God works. Right? He sends missionaries to preach the Word of God, to preach the gospel. Right? We don't pray for God to send visions. Right? We pray for God to raise up what? Missionaries, pastors, and teachers. Right? We pray that God helps these translators translate the Word of God into, into previously unknown languages so that they can have the Scriptures to be able to what? be convicted of their sins so they can come to faith in Christ. That's the normal process that God uses. Now, Psalm 115, verse 3 says that God can do what He wants. So I want to throw that in as a clarifying. But just know that the normal process God uses, He sends preachers, teachers, missionaries. The cults use this. The cults use these unverifiable experiences to deceive and gain followers. Mormons, JWs, Christian science. You know the thing about Christian science? It's not Christian, it's not science, right? Christian science, Seventh-day Adventist. This new, I don't know if you've ever heard, the Eastern Lightning, which is a big cult in China, which is a woman who's claimed that she's the Son of God, right? She saw mystical experiences, right? I saw it on Australian TV. I saw their program. That's why I looked it up. Right? It was a TV one night. It was Sunday afternoon. We saw something. I'm like, what is this heresy? So I had to look them up. Eastern Lightning. Right? It's good to be skeptical. Right? All right, we'll finish up real quick here. If you go back, Colossians, he says, they're taking their stand on visions, their pride, their, their, excuse me, their false humility, worship angels. They take their stand on visions. They're inflated without cause. And then finally, look, they, they do something that's the most damning. What do they do? They don't hold fast, verse 19, to the head, right? What's the head? The head is Jesus Christ, right? They don't hold fast, right? You think about a ship in a storm. What are you doing in a ship in a storm? You're holding fast to those ropes, and you don't want to let go, right? The idea is they, they're not holding fast. They're, they, they're more interested in glorifying self and their, and their experiences than they are in glorifying Jesus Christ. In fact, they diminish Jesus Christ by saying that He's not capable of satisfying all the needs in your life from a spiritual standpoint. Right? We know Jesus is head of the church, Colossians 1.18. We know that Jesus is head over all rule and authority in Colossians 2. You see, these, these false teachers, they weren't Christians. Paul says that if you're not attached to the head, then you're not part of the body, Right? I can cut off Jordan's arm and, and I can try to stick it on my body, but it doesn't, it's not part of my body. Right? If you're not attached to the head, you're not a Christian. Right? No matter what you say. Without Christ, our spiritual life what? Diminishes. Right? The head directs the Benji could tell you this in great depth, Nia as well. The, the head directs the, the blood flow, the circulatory system, the nervous system, right? The head, the brain directs to what? The, the structural part of our body, the bones, the skeletal system. And that's what Paul said when he says, look, he talks about the joints and he talks about the ligaments. He, he's just talking about how all the parts are interconnected. We're all necessary as the body, but, but they're not holding towards the head. And then he says, look, the growth that, that we grow as individuals and as we grow corporately comes from God, Right? Christ causes that growth. It's not through visions or dreams or, or speaking in tongues or, or, or visionary experiences. It's from Christ. And you know what? One of the great thing about it is Ephesians 4 is that God gives the church what? He gives it, first of all, the Word of God to reveal Himself and His will. And then He gives men, pastors and teachers to the church to help the church understand the Word of God. What Then He gives us all spiritual gifts that we may use in the body to, to serve each other, to edify, to equip, to build up us. 
right? He instructs us in His will, and He gives us the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to empower us. It's the growth that comes from God. It's the picture of the vine and the branches. The spiritual life comes from the head. Why are we turning as church? Why are we turning to something else other than the head for our spiritual life? Growth comes from God. I'll put Addie on my shoulders. I did it at the show because she's dying. We walked 20 miles or 20 kilometers, something like that. So she's on my shoulders. Well, Addie doesn't like that. So she grabs hold of my head as hard as she can, and she, she'll cover my eyes up, and she's just grabbing hold to my head as hard as she can. She won't let go. And I have to take her off because I can't see, right? I always think about that should be us with Jesus, right? Holding on to Jesus as tight as possible, right? Anything that comes in our lives, any experience, any, any, any tidbit of doctrine, any, any, any thoughts, we need to go to the Word of God and say, look, does it match up? Are we in submission to His will? You know, is, it, is it according to what we know about God? We know about Christ. Because Peter says we have everything we need for spiritual life and godliness. God's Word is sufficient. Have you guys ever come or watched a sporting event in which an umpire made a call that was so bad, a referee, right? Cricket, swimming, tennis... American football, footy, you know, you ever, you ever heard or read or I've been to some games where the, the calls were so atrocious, so terrible that it cost the team the victory. Well, last, uh, last January in American Gridiron, there was one of these calls where uh, New Orleans Saints, they were basically, you could say they were robbed in that sense. They, it was, they were defrauded of their victory because the referees made such a terrible call. And if they had won that game... They, if they'd had that call, they would have won the game and they would have gone to the grand final. In fact, it was such an atrocious call that the head of officiating for the league called the team and apologized. How often does that happen, right? They've even instituted rules this year that some referee calls can be reviewed because it was so atrocious. Believers, do not allow false teachers to be your spiritual referee to defraud you of your spiritual life in Christ, right? Your joy, right? Your assurance. Base your belief off the objective truth of the Word of God. That's why we study the Word of God, to know God and to know His will, right? Don't allow spiritual referees, these false teachers that come in, that claim to have visions and dreams and emphasize subjective experience over objective truth, don't allow them to defraud you, right? Christ is sufficient. He is the God man, and you are complete in Him. You have everything you need. He is sufficient for you. Right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we have objective truth. Lord, we don't have to, we don't have to just muddle through this life. We don't have to think about how to live, that we have your guidebook for us that teaches us your will, that teaches us who you are. Conform us to your image by renewing our minds as grown as far as this world. Help us to not be conformed to this world and the ideas about things. Help us to not be influenced and led, led astray by the desire for experiences. Father, we know that our emotions are involved in our worship of you. But help us to hold ourselves to the standard that is written. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your warning. We just pray that you would be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen.